Amen. If you would, take your copy of God's Word and open with me to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be looking at the entire story, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, but we're going to begin by simply reading verses 21 and 22. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we pray today that as we study your word together, that, that Lord, our hearts would be open to hear from you. Lord, we know that wherever we find ourselves, you are there. And I, we don't simply mean by that uh, what address uh, we are worshiping you at this morning. Lord, wherever we find ourselves, whether we find ourselves in fear, whether we find ourselves in frustration, whether we find ourselves bored or, or, or longing to be with, with friends and family, Lord, wh wherever we are, you are with us. Lord, you're there to comfort us and to, to, to care for us. But, Lord, you are also always, as you care for us, part of that care is welcoming us to follow you, inviting us to follow you so that, Lord, whatever day we find ourselves in, we can be agents of your mercy and love in this world. Lord, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts might be pleasing in your sight. O oh, Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, in our passage today, Peter asks one of the most practical of questions. Jesus, how many times should I forgive a brother or sister who has offended me? It's a practical question because we know that, that anytime people find themselves living together in close proximity, they have a tendency to offend one another. We know this because we have been living with our families in close proximity. And you've already heard stories from me last week about how not, not only can we frustrate one another with innocent behavior, but it's also really easy for us in the midst of our fears and our frustrations to snap at one another, to, to do things that, that really go beyond just frustrating. We can in, unintentionally and sometimes in our sinfulness even intentionally hurt each other's feelings, and harm one another. For life to happen together in community, it requires forgiveness. It requires those moments where we prevent an offense from undoing our relationship to one another. And to, to overcome that offense, offense, it requires forgiving. And Peter wants to know how many times should we forgive one another? Uh, and before picking on really any of my immediate family members today and then needing to ask for their forgiveness later, I'll pick on the one family member who is probably least likely to listen online this morning, and that is my brother. When we were younger, uh, we loved to, 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 to play together. We, we spent all day together. In the summer times, we were with each other 24-7. Uh, we loved to play board games. We, we loved to make up games in the house. We also, as we got a little bit older, loved to play basketball in the driveway. In fact, we often played that, that game, one, that one-on-one -on -one game, 21. I don't know if kids still play that today. But this is almost, uh, this, this pattern would happen over and over again. We would go play, and, and, and one person, would be a little rougher than the other expected or, or, or simply would win in such a way that then they rubbed it into the other's face a little too, too much. And, and inevitably, one of us would look at the other, uh, perhaps throw the ball down, walk away, and say, I'm never playing with you again. We'd storm off the court and into the house. Now, we were good at getting offended by one another, but the truth is in those days, because we just had each other to play with, we were also pretty good at forgiving one another. After there was a season of cooling off, a time of cooling off, uh, usually a matter of really minutes, at most an hour, we would find ourselves bored and alone. And we would go to the other and, and really in an act of forgiveness, even if we didn't use those words, say, hey, do you want to go play basketball again? I don't know about you and your family. As grown-ups, my brother and I offend each other less now. I'd like to say it's because we've matured. It's probably because we don't see each other quite as often. Anytime people live together, like we said, anytime they are in close proximity with each other, they will offend each other, sometimes intentionally, 
We know because we are sinful. Sometimes they will even sin against each other, knowing fully well what they are doing. Wives and husbands, brothers and sisters, parents and children. These are the relationships that cause us the most pleasure in life. But if we're honest, they're also the ones that can cause us the most anger. For all the news about the tyrants and terrorists and the rest of the world, the truth is that that nobody can hurt you, nobody can offend you quite as often or quite as deep as family. And this isn't just something childhood siblings deal with. Uh, Really, I've been not really surprised anymore, but but really a, a notable part of my ministry through the years has been working with families in seasons of grief when a a parent has died. And it's amazing in those moments how often there are deep hurts, not not just deep hurts perhaps with the parent who has died, but very often deep hurt among grown-up siblings so much that they find it difficult to even come together at, at a funeral to grieve a parent remember one occasion, I think I've shared this story before, of a time where uh, a person in in the community needed a minister to do the funeral, and they asked me to participate, and I didn't know anyone involved. And and I was about to walk up there in the funeral home to do the service when all of a sudden a man came to me and handed me a sheet of paper. On that paper, he had a list of names. He said, this is my name and my wife's name. Those are my children's names. My brother left us out of the obituary, and I was wondering if when you got up to speak, you would mention our names today. I didn't know what to do. I didn't, again, didn't know any of these people. I didn't know this brother even existed. The brother in charge of the service had not mentioned him to me. I didn't know what this fight was about. I didn't know who had done what to whom. I wonder, what would you do in that situation? How would you care for people in that moment of grief? I'm still not sure what the right thing to do was. What I do know for sure is that few people can hurt us quite like family can hurt us. Which brings us back to Peter's question. How many times should I forgive my brother or sister? The Greek there is really the word for brothers, which is used as the word for siblings, but certainly we could include in there, how many times should I forgive my husband or my wife, my parents or my children? How many times should I forgive a neighbor who sins against me? You can tell from Peter's answer that he knows that mercy is a core part of Jesus' teaching. Because Peter doesn't just go with the normal answer of his day, which was you should forgive somebody three times. After that, you can wash your hands of them. No, Peter understands that Jesus is someone who values mercy, whose whose teachings really over and over again emphasize the mercy of God that's supposed to be at work in our lives. So Peter, I think, thinks he's doing a good thing when he comes to Jesus and says, should I forgive my brother seven times? Again, that was the far reaches of what was taught in that day. Most rabbis insisted it's three strikes and you're out. Anything else beyond that is casting pearls before swine. To show a brother or a sister mercy on seven different occasions for the same offense, well, that would be tantamount to just plain stupidity. We're probably with those rabbis. And culturally, uh, we really don't want to give people even three strikes. What's the saying? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, that's right, shame on me. Common sense says that even mercy should have a limit, right? I mean, to do otherwise, just to forgive someone over and over again, seems to be asking for, for really people to walk all over you. Common sense seems to say there should be a limit. And yet, when in the Bible does Jesus ever show up as just being common? In responding to Peter, he blows past right by uh, Peter's generous call for a week's worth of forgiveness and says, no, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. Or depending on your translation, 
70 times 7. The, the Hebrew in translating, I mean the Greek in translating numbers is a little difficult. It, it really doesn't matter which it is, 77 times or seven times, uh, 70 times 7, because Jesus is basically saying, if you are keeping count, you're doing this wrong. You aren't actually forgiving them. People who keep keeping score, even when they say they are forgiving people, haven't actually forgiven them. They are just postponing revenge. Jesus' teaching says that those who are truly merciful, like those who are filled with love, keep no record of wrongs. It is a really pretty thing to read at a wedding, isn't it? That, that love keeps no record of wrongs, but it does feel a little insane in everyday life. I mean, who keeps no record of wrongs? What kind of logic is that? That's the kind of logic that gets you run over, taken advantage of, bamboozled, swindled, just, uh, you know, it, it will cause you all sorts of grief in this life. And Jesus knows that we think this is illogical, so he tells us a story. And it's as if he's saying, I'll show you what's really illogical it's like there was once a man who owned another man a large sum of money. For keeping score, this is how much money it was. 10,000 bags of gold is what the NIV says. The, the original is 10,000 talents. To put that in perspective, all of Herod's tax roll was 600 talents. And this one man owes his master 10,000 talents. Talents. It's so much money, it would take the average worker 200,000 years to pay all the money back. Which shows how foolish this man was that he, he goes to his master and he pleads for mercy, saying, Be patient, I will pay you back. There's no way that he could pay him back. That was the whole point of this part of the story, that the man owed his master so much it could never be paid back, not in a thousand lifetimes. Which makes the mercy that the master shows the man all the more miraculous. The rich man has pity on this fool of a man and forgives him all that he owes him. What the forgiven man should have done is gone out and celebrated. But what he should have done is gone out and paid for all of his friends' meal. He should have gone out and thrown a big party with a banner on the wall that says, The master does not keep score. Instead, he goes out, and the moment he gets a chance, he finds a man who owes him a small amount of money. The NIV calls it a hundred silver coins. That is a hundred denarii. A hundred silver coins compared to, to, to 10,000 bags of gold. And he immediately pulls out, uh, you know, his, his, his book. And he, he looks in there and he demands that this friend pay him all he owes. It's kind of scorekeeping that Jesus says is illogical. That a man who has been forgiven so much would then go and demand that someone who owes him one six hundred six hundred thousandths of what he had been forgiven pay him that very day. That kind of lack of mercy, lack of forgiveness, Jesus says, is what is illogical in this world. In the story, the, men's, the man's neighbors could see this. They could see how ridiculous this was, that he had been forgiven so much and yet wouldn't forgive a little. So they go back and they report this man to the master who grows very angry. He calls him not only a wicked man, but he throws him in debtor's prison and now demands that he pay back everything he owes. We could see how ridiculous this story is as well if we could see that it is our own own story. For we are a people who have been forgiven much. We are a people who, because of our sinfulness, owed a debt to God that we could never pay. No amount of, of, of do-gooding, no, no amount of church attending, no, no amount, uh, amount of penance for our sins could ever bring us to the place where we had paid God back what we owed him. And yet God in his mercy sent his very son to die for our sins that we might be forgiven and set free. Jesus says when we sinful human beings fail to forgive our brothers and our sisters, our mothers and our fathers, our, our parents and our children. We are like this man who has been forgiven the debt of 10,000 bags of gold. 
all the while we demand a few coins of silver. Jesus' point is this, that the real question of our lives is not how often we should show mercy to others. Really, the question is not where is the limit of our mercy. The true question is, can we ever fathom the limitless nature of God's mercy for us? If we could ever begin to get a clue of how much we have been forgiven, we would have no trouble forgiving those who offend us. All that being said, we we get that in our heads, but then we go out and try to live real life, don't we? And the idea of actually forgiving someone over and over and over again, it just doesn't feel like it would really work for us. Again, we, we are keeping score. We are thinking about how can I keep from getting taken advantage of? And perhaps there's one caveat to this this story in Matthew 18 that really if we put it in the larger context of the chapter, we we back up and we see at the very beginning of Matthew 18 what Jesus is having a discussion with his disciples about is how to correct one another. Being merciful towards one another doesn't mean that we let each other sin without accountability. That, That God holds us accountable for our sins. That is, he convicts us of our sins and he will punish us for our sins unless we repent and turn to him. So there is a place in our lives to hold one another accountable for wrongdoing. But but our goal in life shouldn't be to cut one another off. Our goal in life shouldn't be to seek revenge. That our goal ought always to be a posture of mercy because God has been merciful to us. That while we, we, we hold one another accountable for wrongdoing, the very nature of forgiveness does this, right? To to forgive someone is to say, you have harmed me, but I will not hold it against you. There is in that that very phrasing this idea that we aren't excusing wrongdoing. We aren't pretending like it doesn't exist. We name the wrongdoing. But because we have been so overwhelmed by God's mercy, what we are saying is we will not let your wrongdoing dictate the way we see the world. God's mercy is so overwhelming that there is nothing you could do to me to keep me from having a posture of mercy in this world. To to give up on that hope that mercy will win today. To just throw in the towel and to say to anyone you meet, one, two, three, that's it, I'm done with you. Even to give someone seven tries, so long as we are counting, means that we find ourselves in a prison of our own making. At the end of the story, right, the, the fool, the, the man who cannot show mercy, he is thrown back into prison. And yet, friends, when you and I refuse to show mercy to one another, when, when we allow our lives to be dictated by this, this pharisaical type of scorekeeping where, where we, we keep a ledger on one another about how many times we have been offended. It leads to a miserable kind of life. We've all been there, right, in, in family situations or workplaces or, or even in churches where it seems like everyone is keeping score on one another. And it is a miserable, terrible way to live. It is a torturous way to live, uh, living as if uh, everything we do will be held, we will be held account for forever and ever and ever. True freedom comes first because we know that we are forgiven by God, but we extend that freedom in the world when we bless one another with mercy. And God is inviting each of us to live that kind of of life, a kind of life where our lives really are one big joyous expression of God's mercy in the world, where the banner we have behind kind of the party of our life is the master does not keep score and neither do I. Friends, we may not think it's possible, but but with God's spirit at work in us, we actually can be merciful towards one another. It doesn't mean we'll always, our first response will be that of mercy. Again, we are sinful, broken people, but it does mean we can have a posture towards one another each and every day that is built first and foremost on the mercy of God. Which first simply means understanding that that your siblings and your parents, they aren't God, right? 
They, they are other sinful human beings who are making their way in this world, and they don't actually exist to meet all of your needs. One of the ways, one of the reasons we are so short with one another, one of the reasons we so often refuse to give one another mercy is because we are demanding from one another that which only God can give. Only God can truly satisfy our souls. Only God can meet our every need. And sometimes when we've, we've turned our back on God, we go looking for what God, only God can give in a spouse, in a parent, in a child. And that is a demand that no person can meet. And so one of the ways we can show mercy to one another is just by recognizing that the people we are in relationship with, they, they are human beings just like us. They are sinners just like us. They make mistakes just like us. Sometimes those mistakes aren't unintentional. They're, they're willful. And yet, so do we make those kinds of mistakes. And by remembering that great truth, remembering that God is merciful to a sinner like me, we can find our posture towards one another merciful as well. Because the truth is, God is merciful towards your sibling. God is merciful Toward your spouse. God is merciful toward your neighbor. And you don't ever find yourself in a position where you are being more judgmental of another person than God is. But part of being taking a posture of mercy is remembering that, that there is only one God and we are not Him. The next thing we can do is simply to, to own up to our own mistakes. So often we fail to show mercy to one another because we 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 are subconsciously compensating for our own mistakes. I know that I find myself most often offended by others when I have not dealt with my own sinfulness. That, that when I find myself frustrated or selfish, that, that that's so often when the selfishness of others really drives me crazy. And so, in fact, when I find myself being easily offended, when I find myself uh, not just frustrated, but, but, but deeply offended by the behavior of someone else, I, I often have to stop and ask myself, is there something in my own soul that is causing me to be more sensitive to really the offenses of others? And, and very often I will find it's my, my sense of offense is rooted in my own self-centeredness. And that if I could confess that sin and remember to keep God as the priority of my life, then I, then I just don't get offended quite as easily by others. Find it easier to forgive. As we do these things, I, I want you to know this is important because we find ourselves in a day when really the world has never been in more need of mercy. I don't just mean this because we've been living in close quarters for, for eight weeks now, and, and, and we know that even though things are opening back up, we're still going to be in those close quarters for a while longer. I, I mean that as we move back to everyday life, as we do our very best to navigate this, this strange new world where we're trying to do our very best to protect each other's health while also doing our very best to get businesses back going so that people, people can make a livelihood, I want you to know we've never done this before. And on good days, on perfect days, on, on days where everything's going well, we know that we have different opinions from one another. And these are not the best of days. And as we try to chart a course forward, both our leaders, civic leaders, our government leaders, as we chart a course forward as, as neighbors, as we chart a course forward simply trying to figure out how to navigate the grocery store together, when we come back to church and try to figure that out, we are going to have lots of different ideas about how that ought to happen. It's going to be tempting in those hours, in those days, in those months, to be easily offended by one another. But what if as Christians we could model a different way of living in the world? Not one that's quick to be out, uh, offended, not one that seems to delight in outrage, but one that goes out of its way to be merciful to one another. I was in meetings, it seems like, all last week and the week before uh, with different pastor networks as we talked about what it might look like to come back to church as restrictions were eased. 
Now, as you can imagine, you get a whole bunch of pastors together in any kind of meeting. They don't think the same way, and, and this was certainly the case. Some pastors were ready to get back as soon as, as, soon as the government allowed it. Other pastors were, were on the opposite extreme of caution. And as we talked about those things, and people had different ideas, because of our sinfulness, it's easy when someone else has a different idea to think that different idea is itself offensive to your position. That's a silly way of living. That really just because someone thinks differently than you do does not need, mean that you need to be offended. And I was very proud of all of the different pastors groups that I met with. Even though there was very different ways of thinking, it, there seemed to be a general commitment that we wanted to be merciful towards one another and each other's congregations. So that in the coming days, you're going to hear different churches announce different dates for when they're going to be getting back, and, and we'll be doing the same. We don't, we don't actually have a date set yet. We're still working through that process, uh, waiting on certain information from, from different groups of people, uh, and you'll hear about that plan. We'll, we'll communicate it as it comes, but just know there's going to be some differences out there. What we're committed as pastors is being merciful in the way we talk about one another. Being merciful that when we do something different, it, it doesn't have to be seen as, as, ju as a judgment on one another, that, that we can actually be gracious and kind in our words. And friends, as we get back together in the world and we navigate what it looks like to do business with one another, as we navigate what it looks like to, to go back to school in the fall, as we navigate all of those things, just human sinful nature means we will have ample opportunity to be offended by each other. I wonder, what might it look like if God's people, in each of those moments, excels in mercy? Just takes a posture that says, no matter what happens, no matter what another person does or says, I will be merciful towards them. If we do that consistently, over and over again, day by day, then perhaps a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, when people look back at this crisis, what they will remember most of all is not the challenges this crisis brought about, but perhaps the way the church responded to that crisis with God's mercy and love. Friends, I trust we can show that mercy, not because we expect it from other people, but rather because God has already shown that mercy to us.